Well, brethren, God is truly blessing the work, and I think most of you know that. He's been giving us a lot more money, some special offerings, and we're not getting as much regular offerings this year so far, so I hope you won't give up yourself, but last year he did. And now we're on, I think Ms. Rames and I announced eight, but now it's nine news stations we've gone on in the last few weeks, counting the family network. So we'll be reaching, frankly, tens of millions more people, potentially at least, than we did about three months ago. So we should have some growth coming. The growth will come overnight. It usually takes about three to six months before people find us on the dial and get used to where this program is and all that. But it will come through, and we're very grateful for that, and we should thank God for that. It certainly comes from Him, and we're very, very grateful for that. Also, I think I should say, I'm not going to mention names or details at this time. We may do it in the update. Dr. Nail and I have talked about it. But three leading ministers from another Church of God fellowship have come with us just in the last few weeks. And we're very grateful for that, too. And I don't want you to worry about that. We're not going to put them in Mr. Ames' job or Dr. Nail's job. or There's no problem. We know them. I won't go through it now. But in this particular case, it's, uh, I, I helped babysit one of them way years ago. And I really know him. And others have been dear friends for many years. So it's not people we don't know. So as you brethren out around the nation or the world hear about it later, don't worry about it. But we are going to certainly work with them and they are coming with us wholeheartedly from every indication, and uh, we're very grateful to have them. And in time to come, hopefully, God will bring together, and you know I've asked you to pray about this. We even had a church fast about it about two or three years ago that God would bring other brethren with us. So let's welcome them. We're going to have dozens and later perhaps hundreds of new brethren come with us from various Church of God fellowships, who are just sort of been caught where they are. Some of them said we were, we were sleepwalking and they just went with their friends and now they realize they should be where the work of God is being done. And they really mean that. So we're very grateful for that and we do want to thank God for it. And I hope that we can pray that hundreds more will come and welcome them. And we ministers are aware of problems. So don't say watch them. Well, of course, we're going to watch everybody. So it's not up, your, up to your job to take care of that. We will take care of that, and we're not going to let wolves sneak in unaware. But on the other hand, if new brethren come, uh, we should welcome them and even other ministers who come with us because God is beginning to help pre realize that this is where the work of God is being done. And we are thankful that God is giving us that opportunity to be known and through these new stations and the other things like that, God, brethren, is very clearly positioning us. He's positioning us, preparing us in a general way to do a much bigger work. So we want to move forward on our knees. We're not the great ones all of a sudden at all. We need God's help. We need God's mercy. But he is certainly preparing us for a much bigger work. Yet, brethren, at the same time, and many of you watch the world news and you know this, terrible things are beginning to happen. Facebook just came out with 50 different categories. People could list themselves. They could list themselves as homosexual, bisexual, transsexual, transvestite. I can't know all the names of 50 different categories. Our nation is sick, absolutely sick that people could even think that way. But that's where we are. We're going down as a nation. The pride of our power has been broken and is being broken even more month by month. Right now, Russia is invading Crimea, part of the Ukraine, as some of you have heard on the news just today, and I heard it on the 1 o'clock NPR news just before I came here. Russia troops are already preparing to move in. They already have several hundred in there, and they're coming in. And what are we going to do about it? Nothing. We've been degrading our military for the last few years. We don't have the strength, the power to do anything. Our politicians have lost their will. You know, I remember Mr. Armstrong's example of Teddy Roosevelt when America was on the way up and there was a German battleship on the way to the Philippines to try to take over and get Germany in power down there. And Roosevelt was not going to take that. That is Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> and so he 
he uh, sent one uh, word, one telegram to the Kaiser telling him to turn the battleship back, and he sent another telegram. The second telegram was not saying, this is not acceptable. That's what we often say, this is not acceptable. That frightens people to death. <laughs> what he said, he sent the telegram to the commander of the entire Pacific fleet. He said, send, I guess, two or three battleships and heavy cruisers, and if that battleship doesn't set, come back, sink it. That was his second telegram. That's when America was on the way up and we had pride in our power. And we don't have that kind of power. Right now, Syria is filled with people butchering one another in a horrible way. And what do we do? We say that's not acceptable. And we don't do much of anything. And the same thing right now, Egypt is coming apart and their parliament is taking over in a different group of them. Right down in Venezuela, south of here, they've been having riots and getting ready to have another coup, food shortages around the world. Satan is stirring things up and the indicates of because more of that is going on than any time in modern history, just ethnic group after ethnic group, ethnos after ethnos, as it says there in Matthew 24, and then kingdom, nation against kingdom, and then nation against kingdom against kingdom, a different Greek word, basileia, meaning whole groups of nations, we're going to have first, first smaller wars, then more world wars, and the world is certainly preparing for that. But also Satan sees what we're doing, and he doesn't like it. He's stirring up the different nations, but he's also going to stir up people to come after us. We're living at the time of the end. This work has to reach out to this world with power and help them at least know there is a real God and a purpose is being worked out here below. The churches of this world are not doing that. They don't know God. It's not their fault totally. They're partly at fault. They have the book and they know certain things. They don't do it. But on the other hand, we know that they're primarily blinded. But we are not blinded. We have responsibility. But again, Satan knows that and he's going to come after us. So brethren, we need to realize that we have a great war on our hands and Satan hates what we're doing and he has been declaring war on us and he's going to be declaring war on us in the future more than ever in human history. Every year before the Passover, we have problems and people upset. We've had quite a number of little things popping up recently, even around here. I've talked to a couple of our field ministers and they say the same thing is happening there. I can't say it's worse than ever, but we certainly have Satan trying to upset people, turn brother against brother and sister against sister. And Satan will try to use that to hurt the work and hurt your attitudes. So I want us to realize how we can overcome Satan today and I think we need to really understand that because it's going to be happening, this spiritual war on a bigger scale than ever before in human history. And I hope all of you can fully grasp and realize that fact. Turn with me, if you would, back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 12 in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 12. Here we find, as I've often read to you, this story about how a great sign was in heaven and it shows how Christ was born through ancient Israel and how Satan drew a third part of the stars of heaven and angels who became demons and threw them to the earth and he was ready to devour the woman, ancient Israel, who was ready to give birth to the Messiah to birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5, and she first ancient Israel, physical Israel, becomes spiritual Israel later. She, ancient Israel, bore a male child who was to rule all nations. That's Christ, obviously, with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God and to his throne. Now all these things skip ahead. First we find this thing of the dragon. Then we find, uh, well, he threw a stars to, to, to the earth, a war in heaven, and then a male child is born, perhaps tens of thousands of years later, and then that child is caught up to his throne. It skips right back to Christ's ministry. Now it skips ahead a few hundred more years. And so it shows here, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. Heaven is never, never called a wilderness. The church does not rapture it off to heaven. She goes to the wilderness, a place on this earth that they should feed her there 
1260 days or years in prophecy, as we know. Then it skips ahead a few more years. War broke out in heaven. And brethren, this is the final war, as Mr. Armstrong explained it, and as we know, at the end of the age, as you read this passage carefully, this war has not yet started. One of these splinter groups has said it did start. It has not started yet at all. When that starts, we're going to see more wars. We're going to see more perverted sex. We're going to see more uh, perverted demonic killings and murders with people sliced up and tortured. It's going to be terrible when Satan comes down full force. But it's going to happen. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon or the devil, and the dragon and his angels fall and did not prevail. So the dragon is cast out, called the devil, who deceives the whole world. This world really is deceived. And again, I want all of you brethren here and around the world to focus on that maybe more than we have. I may give a whole sermon on that. Frankly, I think we're in Babylon more than we realize when we have our major, one of our major media companies like Facebook say, that you can list any one of 50 categories of what you are. Male, female, homosexual, bisexual, transvestite, they go on and on, and we find that they're teaching that kind of attitude to the little grade school children, and all kinds of things are happening like that through our whole society. We see our society going down. In the Wall Street Journal today, and major editorial about how our nation is coming apart, and people are hurting. They don't know what to do about it. They just don't because the authorities don't do anything and the ministers don't do anything. People are just hurting. They don't know what's happening. But God is bringing Britain, the British descended and American people down and we're being humbled. The pride of our power is being broken and Satan is beginning to deceive the world more than ever where men don't know their men and women don't know their women. And Satan will try to destroy the earth if he can by atomic and hydrogen warfare chemical warfare, other things like that. But if he could also get men to forsake marriage, if he could get women to forsake marry and marry each other, that will be another way he can help destroy humanity. God wants us to be married. God wants us to have children. God is not against sex. God is not against physical love. God wants us to guide those things in the right way according to his laws. But Satan puts a terrible twist on everything like that, a vicious twist. He either causes people to misuse it in perverted sex or foul things that are outside of marriage, or else he'll have people forsake it altogether and have, you know, some terrible perverted relationship with their own gender that could never bring about other human beings. So under those circumstances, where would we be? We'd have an empty earth. There wouldn't be any human beings on this earth. There wouldn't be any beautiful young women holding their child on their breast. There wouldn't be any loving their family anymore. It wouldn't be the same kind of world. They'd all be off here and there doing something else. God, doesn't, God hates that. God is building a family and he wants us to build a family. But Satan is trying to destroy everything that makes life good. He does. He hates it. He's going to tear us to pieces and we have to realize where it comes from. He deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying, Now is salvation, strength, the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. Think about that. There used to be this old song, love song by Cole Porter, you know, night and day and so on. But God says he's letting Satan try to work on us day and night and night and day. Satan never gets tired. He's coming after us and after us and after us. And so we have to understand the battle we're in. Satan is accusing us and Satan will try to get you to accuse one another. I think most of you realize that, but if you don't, if you're newer, you haven't thought about it, he will somehow stir you up against others in the church or if you work in the office, others in the office. Satan will try to subtly undermine the ministry and get people against the ministry so that we can't help you anymore. You become scoffers. Scoffers will arise in the last. Yeah, well, they said this before. Or so-and-so makes some mistakes, this minister elder. Yes, everybody makes mistakes. 
but God guides his ministry in the job they're in, and God guides the church overall, and I've seen that and experienced it now for about 64 years, and I've told you that, about 64 and a half years since I came to Ambassador College. We've had our ups and downs, but overall, brethren, I can start naming them, but I won't, but the brethren who came and obeyed God and walked with God have been blessed. Overall, they were blessed with good lives, good families, and God blessed them and guided them and used them. But some who came and began to play funny games, who began to get into fornication and adultery and heavy drinking and some drugs in later years, and had the attitude, we're going to be in charge and play political games and stab each other in the back, they often are, have a horrible life. And everything goes wrong for them. Everything goes wrong. Some of you might say, well, some of you are dying. Yes, my wife died, and I hate that. But that's not something unusual, because she was in her upper 60s. And I've told you many times, if I die, no, better not one of you leave because of that, because I'm already 13 and a half years older than King David ever got to be 3,000 years ago. So if somebody dies, that's not strange. God does not promise eternal life in this flesh. He just doesn't do that. He lets us have trials and tests. He's let many have many trials and tests, and I've told you about it. I was sent here and there occasionally when I should not have been. Sometimes I was too pushy or too arrogant or too something or other, but sometimes there were no fault at all except I was opposing some evil people who were trying to take over and frankly, one man was trying to orchestrate me getting kicked clear out of the church. And when I came back from a banishment, then God helped Mr. Armstrong see what was happening. And then what he had planned to happen to me happened to him. And he was kicked clear out and has never heard from. In fact, he since died. God says, he that digs a pit will fall into it. And I've seen that happen. Those who go around digging pits for others will often fall into the pit that they themselves have dug. God himself is in charge. He will take care of it. He will fight our battles. Don't ever forget that, brethren. He's in charge. Give your life to God and put your faith and trust in him, and he will work it out. And you'll see that if you wait around and, and walk with God, and you'll see how God is in charge overall. Yes, you'll have temporary trials, he might let some bad guy push around for a while. But in the end, as Mr. Armstrong used to say, in the end, we win. <laughs> and if we means those who serve God, he will take care of us always. And so God, Satan accused us day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, verse 11, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death indicating there might have been torture. They did not want to live anymore. And we're going to enter a time like that. Are you ready? Do you know God? Is God absolutely real to you where you can suffer persecution and say, I'm going to obey God. I will trust God. My life is God's life and not my life. Try to examine yourselves as you approach the Passover. Is God real to you? Can you walk with God, fully trust God? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So this is at the very end of this spirit war that is going to take place within the next several years. It may be two years, it might be 12. I don't want to set a date, I don't know. I think it's going to be shorter than 12 years but probably the next few years, we're gonna see some very strange things happening. And suddenly the nice people that are basically nice over in Europe, they're politicians and all that, but there's gonna be a different look in their eyes, a different look. It's gonna be like the look that people had under Adolf Hitler and where Hitler was raving and ranting and Herman Gables, his propaganda minister, you could hear it. I used to hear it as a boy, screaming against the Jews. And it was terrible. Hitler was going to exterminate them, and he almost got away with it. But God used us, the British and American peoples, to stop him before he got the job done. But that's going to happen to physical Israel, and it's going to happen to spiritual Israel. Satan's going to come after us with hammer and tongs. Satan will come down with great wrath, 
And at the very end, he'll know he has a very short time. When the dragon was, saw that he'd been cast out, he persecuted the woman. So now he persecutes the true church of God, which means you and me, who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she, the church now, might fly into the wilderness. So again, the true church of God had to flee into the wilderness back during the dark ages, and we find many records of how the Waldensians and Albigensians and others like that were hiding out in the Alps and Switzerland and northern Italy and places like that all over. And God allowed the church of God, some kept the Sabbath day, most of them did, most of them, of course, knew about the Passover. They did not all know all seven of the feasts. They tried to at least know the Sabbath, the name the Church of God, and Passover and some of the other feasts. That's all they had. But they did try to obey God, and they had to hide in the wilderness. But once again, here at the very end, the woman has to flee into the wilderness to her place. Is that place Petra over in Jordan? It could be, but we don't know. And Mr. Armstrong gave the very best explanation, which frankly had a way of stating things. I've looked back now that he's been dead many years and kind of marveled. He really knew how to say things sometimes. He says, if the Bible indicates something, it's Petra. It's the only place the Bible gives us any hint about. But he said, the Bible doesn't say that. So we can't say it for sure. It may be somewhere else. Now my son Jim here loves the beach, and he and Mike say it's going to be in... Uh, Fiji or somewhere like that. <laughs> they hope it's going to be in Fiji and some hope it's going to be in Hawaii. And I'd like for it to be up in the mountains because I like the mountains better than the beach. So maybe it could be up at Lake Arrowhead in California or somewhere like that and some beautiful mountains. The point is we don't know. We don't know, but we have to be close to God. That's our protection. If we're walking with God, God will guide us to the right place. I'm digressing, brethren, but I may be dead when this happens, but I said it before, and I want you all to understand that there is a true church of God. And at some point, it may be the council of elders as a whole, but it might just be the leader of the church. who might not be me. It might be someone else. I used to tell, and I think Jim may remember that when he was a boy. I don't know if you remember. I told your mother and Mike and Liz, and I said, look, if that man says we're going to go, I says we're going to go. You remember that? And I did. He's nodding. When Mr. Armstrong, he was God's servant, and if he said it's time to go, I might be embarrassed coming back if it didn't happen, you know. The tribulation didn't happen, but he was God's servant. He was God's servant, and he never said that. He was so dedicated, I'm sure he wouldn't give us a false alarm. He never did say that. You have to have a certain trust, not like you do to God, but a certain trust and respect for the ministry and the ones God places in key positions. At my age, he could take me out any day or any hour. Mr. Ames is getting older, and he's ill today, I understand, a cold or something, nothing serious. But, you know, each one, we're human. But Christ is not human. And if he puts someone in that office and God guides that man who's doing the work of God, preaching the full truth at the end of the age, he says, let's go. You better tell your family, we're gone. We're gone. You come back to an empty house and your neighbors make fun of you. That's too bad. I'd rather that would happen than to miss out and not go to the place of safety. So you have to start thinking, I've got to be sure and know and know that I know that there is a true church, that this is that church, and I've got to have a certain human confidence in the leaders to the degree they're preaching the truth and doing the work. Not that we're perfect. None of us are perfect, and you can figure that out. But we are God's servants. We are God's servants, and I've tried to serve my God for 64 years, and I've made lots of mistakes and been too pushy been, been selfishness, so I did vanity, selfishness, lust, and greed, the four things we used to mention. But I've been faithful to God's word overall with all my heart. And I continue to do that and will do that into my death with God's help. So I hope you can figure that out and try to follow where God's work is so you can be taken to safety and so you can show God, yes, you're with God. You're going to follow him. And if Samuel told Saul to go exterminate the Amalekites, 
Why, you know, Saul could have said, well, it didn't come directly from God. It just came from you, you old man Samuel. Yeah, it came from Samuel. He was an old man. But Saul was condemned and had his kingship taken away because he did not do what Samuel told him. So think about it. Have faith in what Christ is doing. The woman then was to fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished again for three and one half years. So then the serpent, the devil, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away. The word flood is often used as a flood of armies. If you check, I don't take time to read it, but it'll write these down. Isaiah 59, 19, Jeremiah 46, verse 7, and Daniel 9, verse 26. Those are scriptures that would indicate how God uses the term flood for a flood of armies. That's probably the flood he's talking about here. But the earth helped the woman and opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood. God supernaturally protects the church during this time to come, which the dragon spewed out of his mouth. And now at the very end, Satan the devil is enraged. He sees that those who are watching and praying and walking with God, the true Philadelphians are taken to place of safety. But some of this crazy church are left behind. The ones that are laid to sin, that are not really walking with God. And many scriptures show that they're going to have to go through trials. You've heard us read that in Revelation chapter 3 and elsewhere. So he goes to make war with the rest. Who's the rest? Who's left behind? They're not taken to a place of safety. The rest of her offspring, they're not pagans. They're just weak. The rest of her who keep the commandments of God, so they're the church of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're not Jews. They have the testimony of Christ. So they're the church of God, but they're weak, and they're weak enough. They're not taken to the place of safety and protected by God. We're going to have a spiritual war come on us, brethren, and we're going to have to realize that there is a spirit world, that Satan the devil has hundreds of thousands or actually millions of demons, demon spirits. And you've heard me a few months ago, I gave a sermon on the spirit world, and I've shown you how that's very real. I studied that in psychology. Some of the psychologists use examples they don't even understand themselves. They talk about this woman who was a spinster, very close to her father, and then when her father died, why she kind of went bats, and she had all these emotional breakdowns, and all of a sudden she was Miss A, and then Miss B appeared. Miss B took over this woman's mind and emotions, and she had a different look on her face. She suddenly spoke Spanish, which she had never studied. She was at a Spanish dances, which she had never studied. A different personality. That is not a psychological disorder. That is a demon spirit. A demon spirit. We're going to see more and more of that happen toward the end of the age. And we need to understand what we're dealing with. We're going to be in a spirit war as the end of this age approaches. And we've got to know that Satan is very real. And we're going to have to really fight to overcome Satan the devil. He's going to come after us because he does not get tired. As it says back here in verse uh, 10, the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. He won't quit. He keeps trying to come after us and after us and after us. So we have to understand the war we're in. Now, brethren, turn with me back to 2 Corinthians, if you would, at this point. 2 Corinthians, and this is chapter 2. And I want to read, Paul is talking about this uh, man they had to put out for incest, actually, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, this punishment, he told them to put the man out, which was inflicted by the majority sufficient, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one is swallowed up with too much sorrow. Apparently the man, after he was put out, was terribly sorry, distraught. Maybe he was crying and fasting and beginning to come apart. And Paul heard enough to feel the man was really, really repentant now. Really repentant. So Paul says, 
Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I wrote you that I might put you to the test whether you were obedient to in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I forgive. For if indeed I've forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest, notice verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan has various devices where he can really upset people. If they never let the man back in the church and he committed suicide, maybe a good number of people say, oh, the minister's too hard, let this man kill himself. Satan can use things like that, even though the ministers may have been sincere, but maybe a little insensitive. Satan will use things to get at the church. He will use things with his devices to pit brother against brother and sister against sister. So Satan has devices and we want to realize that. Let's turn now, if you would, uh, brethren, uh, I want to have you understand that often Satan will cause a whole wave. And I've told you this, I've seen this happen to people. It's happened to me in the past. He will send Satan the devil wave after wave of discouragements. Sometimes people get terribly discouraged before the Passover. They just have a feeling of just suffering. I can't make it. It's too much. It's too much. And Satan is overcoming them at that point. You've got to understand that. When those feelings come, I don't do anything perfectly. Nothing. So understand that. But I've learned basically to, to deal with that situation. When I, that kind of thing comes on me, I've learned very quickly where it comes from. I thought, wait a minute, anything new happened? No. This comes from an outside force. The devil is trying to overthrow me. He's the one putting these. And then I immediately start praying or I will fast on occasion and cry out to God. God rebuke Satan, take away this wave of discouragement, rebuke Satan, rebuke his demons, cast him away. And whenever I do that, the thing lifts. God hears, he takes away that wave of discouragement. Don't let that thing happen to you. Some people can just be overcome by something like that. Don't let that happen. And uh, so we've got to deal with that. Now let's turn to, Eph to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. This is also nearby Ephesians in your New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 10, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Not the power of your might. You and I don't have very much might. And it's good for us to realize that. Our strength has to come from Almighty God and that constant contact we have with God through Bible study and prayer and meditation and fasting to where we draw close to God and then He will draw close to us if we do that. Put on the whole armor of God. You see, it's a war He's talking about, armor, that you may be able to stand against the wiles. So Satan has devices, and here Paul calls them, in this case, wiles, a different word. He's a wily character. He has various tricks he plays. The wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle, so we're in a fight. And it's good to understand that. You women are in a fight, too. We're in a fight. We wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Wicked spirits in charge of this earth's atmosphere. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Don't just take part of it, brethren. We do need it all. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth. Now, why does he start with the waist? Well, the waist, your, around your stomach areas where you tend to want to eat too much. Many eat way too much and hurt their bodies and bring on heart attacks and high blood pressure and so on or they drink too much liquor and that hurts them or that's the area where the sex drive is too. They misuse sex, they misuse liquor. So you've got to guide those things. It doesn't say it's wrong to eat, it's not wrong to be married. You've got to guide those appetites the way your God tells you to. That's the whole point. As Mr. Armstrong used to say, a bottle of whiskey is not a sin. It is a sin to misuse the bottle of whiskey or misuse the bottle of wine. A thing is not sin, it's the wrong use of a thing. 
So gird your waist with truth. God tells you how to use liquor. He tells you how to use sex. He tells you how to guide your body and your mind. Having put on the breastplate, guarding your heart, your attitude of righteousness. We know what that is. All thy commandments are righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Where do you go? What are you busy at? Doing the work of God. Getting out the gospel. Helping get it out the best way you can. And having shod your feet with that, above all, this is interesting, the most important thing in one sense is love, and yet when you're in a fight, you have to have love, yes, but in a certain sense, as part of an armor, you have to take the shield of faith. That's a great, huge part of the spiritual armor. You've got to know God is there. You've got to know that God is in charge, that Jesus Christ is the living head of the church of God. He will guide it over all and know and know and know that you know that. Then you'll be much better off. The shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Satan will keep sending fiery darts, fiery darts. Oh, so-and-so hurt me. So-and-so is unfair. My boss is not fair. I'm not getting paid enough money. They didn't give me an office by a window. I didn't get a, a plush carpet, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm kind of exaggerated, but people get hurt over little things like that. And don't worry about it. My first office was, well, I didn't even have an office. I worked on a card table behind the Mayfair basement in the student center, student uh, dormitory, Mayfair. I mean that, Dr. Hay and I started getting out the Good News magazine. Mr. Armstrong didn't want us to at first because he felt we weren't good enough writers and editors yet, but he had to put the good news out in place of the plain truth for a year or two. You read that in his autobiography, and our office was a card table. I don't mean a heavy one, just a normal flimsy card table behind the basement, behind the furnace in Mayfair basement. That was our editorial office, and that's what we did. We had uh, my, one of the people that knows me the best, I've told uh, my secretary, uh, Monica, and she's talked to her. So I said, if you want to know all my problems, talk to the first secretary, Elva Sedliacic. Her name was Elva Russell. And we'd call Elva at 3 a.m. Could you come down and type this article? We've got to run it down to Ed Swain here in about four or five hours down at Pacific Press. Oh, yeah, she got right up and came down from the second floor and typed the article, and we'd have it out and take it down to Ed Swain. He was the editor at Pacific Press we worked with in those days. But we just had to do the best we could. We had our student jobs, and I don't think we got paid anything for putting out the magazine. We had to work on the grounds, but we enjoyed doing the work at that time. But at any rate, God was very real to us. And we had no office, and later, Dr. Hay and I had a little office together. We shared his student desk down at the far corner of the basement, and uh, it wasn't a very fancy place at all, but at least we were, it never occurred to me to be upset. I thought that's, that's, that's the way it is, you know. And I'd worked in the woods in Oregon, and I liked it out there. We had to sleep in tents or cleaned out chicken coops, and, and uh, I never complained. I thought, wow, I see the big, beautiful trees, and I enjoyed it. I never thought I was being punished. I just enjoyed being out in God's creation. And so if you worked and slept in a ch cleaned out chicken coop, to have a nice office at Mayfair basement seemed just fine. We were doing the work of God. We didn't have any fancy office, fancy desk, or anything. We just had to do the work of God and hope we were going to get a check. Because the business manager, Mr. Armstrong's son-in-law, Vern Matson, was always running short of money because Mr. Armstrong kept spending it more on stations and more on starting the colleges, and sometimes Vern couldn't pay us, so we had to wait and didn't have much to eat. And so we had to do without, uh, but again, I don't remember anyone complaining, we just had to make do. And Raymond and Mary McNair would have big sacks of wheat and kept fixing wheat and they'd share with us. And Herman Hayes' mother would send us down uh, big boxes of dark uh, German bread and cheese, good thick German cheese. And then Mrs. Elliot, one of the ministers coming with us is her son, and she would send us down a salad she was the wife of the dean of students. She'd send us down a salad two or three times a week because they didn't have much money either, but lettuce doesn't talk, cost very much. So she was able to, she said, I know you boys will probably never get a salad. You won't fix salads. So she'd fix us a salad. So we had some salads, 
and some other stuff that people gave us and we didn't starve to death. Some of you think you're having a hard time. Most of you have never lived like that. But you're not suffering if you don't have a, a, an office with a window and you can't all drive Lexus cars and you can't all, you know what I mean, if we're going to have really hard times. So don't give up and quit because everything's not coming up roses all the time. We're going to be tested. So you have to have the shield of faith with which you're able to quench the fiery darts, these wrong attitudes and accusations. Mr. Armstrong's wrong. He's spending too much money. And, and he read, uh, missed this one teacher called Dick Armstrong, uh, he called Mr. Armstrong the uh, Heavenly Father, and Dick was the Son of God with his red chariot. And uh, Dick had his red chariot. He did not have a Cadillac or an Oldsmobile or any fancy. He had a, a little Plymouth convertible. And so old Molly Annecy made fun of him, Dick's red chariot. Well, Dick took six years to graduate, not because he was dumb, but because he was having to work long hours getting out the old discs to the radio stations. And so he got some money for that. And as a single man, he was able to find, buy this little Plymouth car, and that was fine. But people were criticizing, criticizing, criticizing all the time, picking and picking at Mr. Armstrong in those days. Most of you have never picked at me that way unless you do it behind my back. <laughs> if you do it with me, I'll have to get my cane after you. But <laughs> anyway, but uh, they, they did do that a lot. But you've got to know that God is guiding it. And Dick Armstrong was not rich. He just had a least expensive little convertible that you could get. But it did happen to be red. The wicked one puts out fiery darts. Take the helmet of salvation. That's God's spirit in your mind. A helmet covers your brain. The Holy Spirit goes in your mind. And the, word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the only offensive weapon. You've got to learn to wield, you know, and to thrust and to hack and so forth with that spiritual sword, the Word of God, to know this book, to study this book so you can really explain it to others. Praying always. Don't just pray sometimes. I know Mr. Armstrong never bragged in public about this. I mean it, but because I was very close to him and Dick's friend and spent thousands of hours with him, two or three times he explained over that 36 years I knew him, not every often to show off. But he said, Rod, when I've been in trouble, he said, I'll pray 30 to 60 times a day. He said 30 to 60 times a day. And he meant, and he explained sometimes just in his mind, but he'd pray going up the stairs or coming down the stairs or before something or after something and all day long in a spirit of prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me, Paul said, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I ask you to pray for me that I can do that and pray for Mr. Ames and Dr. Manale and our other leaders. Pray for all the leaders in the church that we may boldly get this message out for which I'm an ambassador in chains. I've sometimes wondered if my chains are not, Paul had literal chains, my chains are sort of my stroke at this time that slows me up. And I'm sure that Mr. Uh, King's cancer sort of is like his chains, kind of slows him down for a while. We all have various chains that we work with. So we have to pray for one another and pray that God will bless us and guide us and lead us and use us. You need this, brethren. You need this constant contact with, with God and beseech God to rebuke Satan and cast him from us and from his church and from his work. So Satan will try to get at us in every way he can, and he will try to get your mind on self. Self, my feelings are hurt, what I want, here's what I think. Well, no, Jesus Christ shows us where to empty ourselves, and he that tries to exalt himself will be abased, and he that abases himself and just tries to give his life to God, he will be exalted. And so we have to get mind off the self and on what God wants, and therefore we will not get resentful and upset at little things like that. Then in Philippians chapter uh, 2, if you would turn there. Wait a minute, I want to go back to chapter 2 of, of Ephesians first. 
Ephesians chapter 2. We've just finished chapter 6. But it says in Ephesians 2, you, he told them, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were made alive through the resurrection, of course, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit. See, there is a spirit power that now works in the sons of disobedience. Satan is busy. He never gets tired. He is working and working to get at God's people to destroy God's church to cause God's people to fight one another, to get upset at one another, to get upset at God, to turn away from God. So we have to understand that enemy is very real and God points out in many, many different ways. Now let's turn, brethren, back to Philippians chapter 2, if you would. Philippians 2 at this point. Paul is writing here in verse 1, <clears throat> to this very fine church in Philippi. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. God does not want us fighting and fussing at one another. He wants us to be of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. We're not to try to have selfish ambition and exalt the self. I would like to be able to have Mr. Scott, when Dr. Scott Winnale and Mr. Soselka and, uh, and all these younger ministers, I better not name Mr. John Robinson and all the other ministers preach every other week. They'd all like to preach more. But I felt it's important, knowing what happened when Mr. Armstrong was away, that as the human leader, as long as I'm here, I try to preach about one-third of the time. And Mr. League makes it out about that way about one-third of the time. I've been away two or three weeks, so I'm preaching now. And then we certainly have Mr. Ames next as the vice president, and Dr. Nail directs the ministry. And then we have some of the others kind of work in from time to time. Last week, my son Jim gave a fine sermonette. And Mr. Sazelka gave a fine sermon. Uh, no, Mr. Rod McNair, and so split sermon, I mean, in each case. And that's not ideal because they'd like to have the whole time. But to get them in on the schedule, sometimes Mr. League has made some split sermons. But we try to give people the opportunity. But at Pasadena, I told them this, but I'll tell you in case you don't understand. In Pasadena, how often did the pastor rank ministers preach? Practically never did they preach a full sermon. <laughs> they used to have the joke that if you're just a pastor rank minister, you just pass out songbooks. That's, it. That's what happened. But it was Mr. Armstrong and the evangelists, and often I only got to preach every eight or ten weeks because it was Mr. Armstrong and then Ted and then someone else. So it kind of rotated. But it is better to have one person or the top two or three set the pace for the church as a whole. And uh, I know that's the best way, and that's the pattern we've tried to follow here. But at any rate, we're not trying to exalt ourselves, but to, and I, I mean that, but to have that pattern that holds the church together and to have a consistent theme and a consistent impact on the church. So being of one accord, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And certainly some of our younger ministers may be better than I am in many ways. And I'm sure they are. They understand certain things better than I do and certainly technical things, mechanical things, and so on. But they may understand certain scriptures better. But we each need to understand we're there. God guides the thing overall. And we're to do the best we can where we are. And you each individually need to think about it that way. Look on your brethren and your brother and sister next door, sitting next door, this person may be better than me in certain ways. They might be better than me in every way. We all need to understand that and humble ourselves and ask God to guide it for good. Let each one look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So if your mind is on the others, wanting them to be in God's kingdom, wanting God's work to get out the best way possible, you won't get your feelings hurt over little stuff. You just won't. 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He had been with God and was very God, and he emptied himself and came down out of the heavens and gave his life for us. He says, have that mind, the mind of total service and giving and sacrifice. So that's what God is telling us here, and we need to understand that. Now let's turn to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can you rejoice if you just lost your job? How can you rejoice if you are sick? How can you rejoice if you're with a ball and chain? Well, Paul had a ball and chain around his ankles and was in jail about five out of the last 10 years of his life. He really was. Read about it. Two years at Caesarea, three months as a prisoner on the way to Rome, two more years plus. We don't know how much longer in Rome. And then back the second time for probably a year and a half or two years in Rome as a prisoner. He said, rejoice. <laughs> He's the one writing this. You can know God is there. He's your father. You're having trials. I could have said I'm having trials when I worked in the woods in Oregon and I was only able to take a shower once or twice a week on the weekends. All during the week, we had to sit this big uh, wash tub out under the sun and take time every day. Well, we only got one bath during the week, usually that way. But we, were over, we, were, we, we just smelled each other, so it didn't work too bad. We were out of doors. We weren't suffering. We had enough to eat and plenty of work to do. It was exciting. So learn to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let your graciousness, I think it's better translated here, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Remember, he is coming soon. Get right with God. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be all anxious and worried, but in everything by prayer and supplication, that is prayer and continual prayer and fasting and beseeching God with thanksgiving. Talk to God with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So brethren, I hope that you can all think in that way and learn to talk to God in that way. Think, brethren, how do you pray? Jesus said, our Father, after this manner pray you, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. As you get down on your knees in the morning, and try to let, get a place where you can look out to the sky if you can. I like to get in front of a window and I can literally see the trees in the sky and picture God up there a little better. Some of you can't do that. For years over in England, I couldn't do that. I had to pray in the bathroom and, and I had a little tiny window up there, but it was often raining or foggy in England, so I didn't get to see it in that way, but still I was able to pray. But our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Think about God and Christ at God's right hand, not picturing features, don't that, but you're just picturing. They're, they're up there in a general way, great blinding light and glory and power and magnificence. Hallowed be your name. Try to get your mind on God's greatness and his power, his wisdom, his love, his magnificence. Picture the fact that he has created this beautiful earth, this beautiful earth of the vast universe, the sun, the moon, the stars that he is the one that's made us in his image. He's made us to be like him someday. He's given us creative imagination. He's given us understanding. He's made us male and female, which is wonderful. And all the joys of love and courtship and marriage and sex and family and children and great extended family and the love and joy we can have in that. God wants that. God wants that. He's going to have a tremendous extended family pretty soon. God is the one that made all those things. He's the one that says wine makes glad the heart of man. Don't get drunk, but you enjoy what God has made in the right way. He's made us where we can have beautiful sights around the world. We can see and travel. We can have wonderful family experiences. We can have a mate. We can have joy. We can have children. And he wants us to have those things. And he's making us his full sons to walk with him, talk with him, commune with him, interact with him, and interact with Jesus forever. And learn to think that way. Father, you're there, and I'm here. I'm your son. 
and talk to him back and forth and back and forth and walk with God, talk with God, make God real as you pray to him every morning on your knees before you leave the house. One of our evangelists said years ago, he said, I don't want to go out of the house without prayer. It's like going out naked. Would you go out naked? Well, most of you wouldn't like to do that. Well, why go out spiritually naked? Why would you leave your house without prayer? Talk to God the first thing. I don't do it the very first thing. Some of you need a cup of coffee first. I don't. I'm okay that way, but I do get up and I put on my prayer pants, I call them, some old slacks or khaki pants and, and robe or something, and I, I, I shave. So I get water on my face and get awake, shave and wash and comb my hair. Then I pray before I eat. Some people do better to eat first, but I, I don't. With my blood is all down in the stomach digesting my food, I can't be as earnest in my prayer. So I try to pray before I eat. Get that in your mind, a way of life that you created to walk with God, to talk with God, to commune with God, to be back and forth with God, be where God becomes real to you, and you know that you're actually interacting with your Creator, your Heavenly Father, and thanking Him. Say, Father, thank You for being our Father. Thank You for making us male and female. Thank You for giving us family. Thank You for giving us loved ones. Thank You for giving us the opportunity to know You. All those things you can thank God for and pray to God and know to God, and then in that way have a deep faith in God that God becomes very real to you because of that. So I hope all of you can do that, brethren, and that way strengthen yourself where Satan will never be able to get at you. Later then here, let's go to verse 8 now in Philippians chapter 4. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, not dirty sex ideas, pure things, whatever things are lovely, that gives you guys a chance to realize we have pretty girls, but you don't want to think about it the wrong way. <laughs> whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What are you meditating on? Positive things. Positive things, not negative things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. So God wants us to learn to be positive, and if we're positive, Satan can't get at us near as easily. Turn with me now back to Job, if you would, the book of Job chapter 34. This is Job uh, chapter 34. Here's Job, and God is guiding these verses to teach us a lesson here in Job 34 and verse eight. They were accusing Job, and yet he was a servant of God. He says, what man, and this is verse 7, Job 34, 7, what man is like Job who drinks scorn like water, as though Job had a wrong attitude, who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men? It shows that you should not do that. They knew that was wrong. Don't walk with wicked men. It will rub off on you. But now let's turn to Proverbs chapter 12, a more positive teaching about it. Proverbs chapter 12, brethren, and let's begin here in verse 26. He says, the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. A lot of young people sort of just fall in with whoever they're around, and that wrong attitude of the guy that you happen to room with or right down the hall rubs off on you, don't let that happen. You don't have to hate him, but if he pulls you down, if he pulls you down, pull away. Be sure you can make it. Now, we who are full ministers with training ought to be able to go in and not just fellowship but spend time with anybody, and it won't hurt us. I've got to do that. If I'm God's minister, I've got to go in with the weakest person but I'm God's minister and I'm gonna just be buddy-budding with him but I can help him whoever he is and he won't hurt me as long as I'm close to God. But newer brethren in the church, be careful. Choose your friends carefully. Choose people that are converted. Choose people that are positive. Not, well, yeah, these ministers, they talk and blah, 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 and let's, let's make some fun of them. Let's put them down, let's do this and that. Is that going to help you? No, it's not going to help you. It can get you right out of God's kingdom. 
So choose your friends very, very carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. And then turn to chapter 13, Proverbs 13, verse 20, one of my favorite verses I've often quoted. He who walks with wise men will be wise. If you walk with wise men, if you spend time with other leading people in the church, capable people, dedicated people, then that will rub off on you. So he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So you've got to be careful who you're around. You can pray for these other people, but if you sense they're rubbing off on you and hurting you, and you yourself are new, don't let it happen. You must not let Satan get at you through some scoffer. Well, yeah, they've always talked about the end of the world. The end of the world never comes, never comes, blah, blah, blah. Well, we've been talking about the end of the world for the last 40 or 50 years. That's certainly true. But we've always said it might be later. I used to say 17, 7 to 17 years, or it might be later. We can't be sure. And I often kidded, as Mr. Ruddleson could tell you, who gave the sermon ad, and Mr. Turner were in my classes and Big Sandy. I, seven, I would often say, well, this, fellas, remember this is first Meredith 3, 4. It's not first John 3, 4. You know, sin is the trend. It just, I feel, is probably going to happen. But we don't know that. And we must not set dates. But these things that Mr. Armstrong wrote and talked about and, and prophesied are happening now faster than ever. And most of you see that, you older brethren. This world really is coming apart. But don't let the kind of scoffer attitude rub off on you and hurt your spiritual attitude or scoffer attitude about anything else, about the minister made a mistake. Well, of course the minister made a mistake sometimes. He's human. He's not perfect. But unless he's turned clear away, he may still be God's minister who can teach people, help people, strengthen people. So don't sit around judging. As Jesus said, don't sit around watching the little splinter in the other guy's eye. Be sure you put the beam the great big two by four out of your own eye. Put the great big two by four out of your eye before you start picking at the other guy. Your job is to think, how can I get closer to God, not be the great judge of everybody else? If you turn yourself into the great judge of everyone else, that can hurt you terribly. It can give you a wrong spirit and bring you out of God's kingdom. So I hope you understand that. Now let's go to another scripture here, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, brethren. Hebrews chapter 12 at this point. And uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Paul is talking about how God rebukes and chastens every son he loves. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous, Certainly it hurts when God spanks us, humbles us, brings us down. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet uh, so that it, what is lame may not be distorted but rather healed. Uh, he continues here. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. Constantly try to have peace with your brothers. Forgive them, help them, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking diligently, get this, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Mr. Armstrong used to say that bitterness is like heroin. If you get hooked on bitterness, if you have a spirit of bitterness, if that comes over you, then it's almost, it's very difficult to help anyone get out of that. They're just simply overwhelmed with self-pity and resentment, and as we say, bitterness. Bitterness, just bitter, and you can't reason with them after a while. For your sake, please don't ever let yourself get into that. You can't think straight. This man hurt me, and he did me wrong, and I won't forgive him, I'm mad at him forever. No, don't feel like that. Say, Father in heaven, he's a human being. He's made a mistake. I know I make mistakes. Please help me to forgive him. He doesn't need to be my best friend, but I can forgive him and help him and hope that he gets in God's kingdom and help him. God says, even give your enemies a cup of water. Help them when they're down. Feed them in time of need. They're fellow human beings. 
Don't ever get involved with a root of bitterness springing up, causing trouble, and by this many become defiled. As Mr. Armstrong said many times, a root of bitterness can just poison your mind and you can't get it out. Lest any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright, don't get into bitterness or treat things cheaply. Don't treat your salvation cheaply. Don't treat the church of God cheaply. Don't treat the opportunity to come to church cheaply. In the old days, brethren used to drive two or three hours out in West Texas and Arizona, Colorado, to be able to go to church. They do, no one told them, no one men yelled at them. They would drive two or three hours for the privilege. And yet we have people here that come when it's convenient. If the weather's a little bad, they don't come or whatever. And a lot of you in the local churches know that where there are people like that. It's a privilege. Don't treat the truth cheaply. Pretty soon this power in Europe's going to bring us into slavery. Our nation will go down. These things will happen. And you'll look back on the church of God, the opportunity to learn. And you'll say, boy, I wish I'd listened. I wish I'd learned. Even today, I wish that I'd studied the Bible a lot more when I was a young man and had more physical and mental energy to research and go deeply into it. Do the best you can. Don't treat God's truth cheaply. Don't treat God's church cheaply. cheaply. Don't treat God's ministers cheaply. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. So don't be like this one that got into that and then treated cheaply. Uh, uh, you know, Esau gave up his birthright for a bowl of lentils. Don't let that happen to you. It can pull you out of God's kingdom. All right, I want to give you a few examples here of things you need to think about here if we have the time. How, what are Satan's devices? Satan's devices may include, and I don't give you scriptures for all these, but I could come up with scriptures. I just want to save time and give you some key things to think about. Satan's devices may include causing bitterness. We've already just covered that, so you know the scripture. Causing bitterness to come through hurt feelings. The old uh, country western song, he done me wrong, you know. <laughs> okay, he done you wrong. Forgive him. Get over it. Move on. Don't let bitterness overcome you through hurt feelings or your own lack of respect for God and for God's ministers. You just get yourself out of joint too quickly. Satan's devices may include uh, using your own lusts, where Satan will, will act on your own lusts for sex, for liquor, or for just fun. Some people just want to goof around all the time and they don't seem to want to get involved seriously. And he'll cause those things to destroy you. He will also cause you to, to uh, focus on the self Satan can very quickly do that. Oh, I'm just entered in self. And how do I look? And do I have as good a clothes as the other guy? Or is my office as big as the other guy? Or do I have as nice a car as the other guy? So what? You're alive. You have enough to eat and to wear. You're in God's church. Be grateful. Don't just focus on the self and what you want and not focus on loving and serving God, your creator, worshiping God with all your heart and strength and mind and on serving your fellow human beings. If your mind's on serving your fellow human beings, it's hard to get your feelings hurt. I know when they weren't perfect and I wasn't perfect, and none of us have been perfect. But when Raymond McNair and I went out on the baptizing tour for 10 and a half weeks, and Burke and I went out the next summer, 1952, for 11 weeks, and then I took Dr. Hay out on a baptizing tour for about six weeks, and then he took Norman Smith the rest of the summer, Back in 1951, 52, and 53, we were losing sleep. We were losing meals. I mean, regularly. I'm not bragging. I had no reason to lie. Liars don't get into God's kingdom. We didn't have regular meals at all. We had to get about five or six hours sleep. Did Mr. Armstrong have a whip making us? No. We just knew we wanted to reach all these people we could. And we talked to them about baptism. And we had to turn about half of them down. 
We weren't trying to get them recruited, by the way. A baptizing tour wasn't trying to recruit people. It was to see if these people were ready. They had already written in asking. So we had to say, well, get these booklets and read these and, and prove things more, and we'll be back next year, we hope. <laughs> and some of them died before we could get back. But we were trying to help them. And all day long, we were losing sleep and missing meals and driving ourselves physically to reach these people. Some of them cussed us. That is, their unconverted husband would cuss us or point a gun at us. I didn't go around and say, I'm mad at all of them. I couldn't go around like that. I thought this old farmer's all out of sorts because his wife is interested in Mr. Armstrong. And I didn't think about it. So he was carnal, and that's too bad. He's carnal, and God hasn't called him. One old guy in Louisiana, I've told you this story, jumped on Ted Armstrong and me. I took him on a tour in East Texas and Louisiana. I think he writes about it in his little autobiography thing he had. But I took him out for just three and a half weeks right after his son David was born. And we were together day and night, sleeping in the same motel, traveling in the same car, eating together all day long. But at any rate, we went up and this rack, uh, shack and he came to the old wooden porch and, and uh, he said, who are you guys from? And he said, well, we're from Ambassador College. And he just yelled at us, Armstrong. And he grabbed the chair and began to hit us with the chair. Of course, we grabbed the chair and he wasn't able to hurt us. And so he began to cuss. And he had a wonderful vocabulary. You can't believe the vocabulary <laughs> some of you fellows have been cussed at. He was a really good cusser. He called us every name you could think of. Did I get mad at him? Honestly, I'm not mad at him. I just thought, here's an old cusser farmer. He was all mad because we were from Armstrong. So you have to get over it. Move on. And other men would point guns at us and cuss us or various things. You don't go around with your feelings hurt all the time. You just got to live your own life. Move on. Don't get a root of bitterness. Don't get your mind on self, but how you could serve these human beings, even if their husband tries to hit you with the chair. That's okay. <laughs> he, he tried to get it. He said, I'll go get the gun. I told you this before. And instead of getting the gun, he came back with another chair. I thought, that's wonderful. He just got another chair. <laughs> so we took that chair away too. Anyway, uh, Satan will try to guide your life or direct your life circumstances to where you uh, cut way back. He will influence you to cut way back on your personal Bible study and meditation and prayer and fasting. I remember on those baptizing tours in 51, 52, and 53, I really would, didn't have a lot of time, but I sure prayed because we had to all day long and prayed in the morning. But then in 54, Mr. Armstrong sent Dick and I to Europe, first class on the Queen Elizabeth. And suddenly we were eating out of nice restaurants and going here and traveling around all day in Europe. And somehow I didn't realize for a while I had it too easy and I wasn't praying as much. And it hit me about halfway through the summer. Wow, I'd better watch out. Affluence, if you have too many good times, it can really weaken you, really weaken you. Satan can pull you right into the world and you're not praying fervently. You're not really studying like you should. And I began to have to wake up and take one day and told Dick I wasn't feeling well and I wasn't feeling well spiritually, <laughs> but I had to fast and try to pray a lot more. Satan can cause you to be puffed up with your own vanity and to lose your fear of God. I'm pretty important I'm doing real great and I've got this big job or I'm important here, important there. So what? You know, a lot of men might think if they had my job, men out in the churches around that they, boy, Mr. Meredith is a very important man and has this big office as secretary and he must strut around like he's on pink cloud 13. No, I'm a clod of dirt and I know that and I'm getting to be a very old clod of dirt. <laughs> and that helps me to be humble. But you've got to realize none of us is anything. So number your days, it says there in Psalm 90. We don't have any more days. Serve God while you can. Don't be puffed up. You say, well, I'm young. I'll never die. No, I used to think that. Then my friend Dick Armstrong did die all of a sudden at age 29. Bang, hit by this car at age 29, crushed his whole rib cage and lungs were burst and everything went wrong and he died at age 29. Don't be puffed up. 
or lose your fear of God, the awe of God that I preached about a few weeks ago. Satan may guide you to spend time with selfish people and situations and, be, and with negative people. Again, choose your friends carefully. Don't let circumstances and Satan get you over with smart alecks, people that are, you know, against God, that are always uh, putting people down, that are putting down the church, putting down the ministry. Don't let that happen to you. So be sure you avoid these pitfalls and many others. So brethren, be aware of the wiles of Satan. We must win this battle. We're into a battle with Satan the devil, a tremendous great super archangel or cherub that has great power. We need God's help to overcome. Turn to 1 Peter now. 1 Peter, if you would, and let's turn to chapter 4 here in 1 Peter. And I want to read here, no, I'm sorry, in chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. That's hard for many of you. Some of you young people are so energetic and you want to do this and have fun, and I understand that, but be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud. If you're proud of yourselves, you've got a big job, or you've got a big car, or you've got a pretty girl, or this or that. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. He will exalt you, but not right away necessarily, in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be truly dedicated and humble and thoughtful. Be vigilant where you're really alert. No, I'm in a battle. I dare not lose this battle. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may decide, I'm going after you or you or you, whoever you are, in this building right now. And he has power that you don't have. So realize your battle. Resist him. Don't let it happen. Fight. Fight with fury against this spiritual wickedness. Fight him. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us into his eternal glory, as it ought to be, by Christ Jesus, when? Immediately? No, not always. He doesn't always give us everything immediately. After you have suffered a while, he will put you through trials and tests for a while first. May he, after you've suffered a while, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So brethren, let's fight the battle. Let's win the war. Let's overcome Satan. Let's realize we are in a spiritual war. And we need the whole armor of God. And this world is going to start persecuting us. Foreign enemies are going to start persecuting our nation. Some of us that we're not watching might be herded into concentration camps later, right along with the Laodiceans. Even then, don't give up. God is God. He's still there. And put your faith and trust in him. And he will help you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I've seen that over and over. I could name many names for 64 years. Never give up on God. As Churchill said, never, 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 never give up. The kingdom of God is there. The kingdom of God is awesome. The kingdom of God is worth it.